So if you go back to the network drive, I've got there the two little sketches I made, the long tail and the, the, the Y. Uh, you can have those if you'd like. And then also I put in an item that says Campos SEO 1 long tail strategy. I'm going to give you a few documents as the course goes on, uh, labeled with numbers. Um, so uh, again, from that folder, you want to drag it to your desktop or your USB, and we'll take a look at it. So copy that from the network folder, and we'll look at it. And that was the one called Campos SEO One Long Tail Strategy PDF. So at the top, what does your brand offer? What does your company offer? Nowadays, search engines don't rank your site very well unless you have good content. It's not just about just keywords anymore. You're not going to be found when people search for Italian restaurants. You will have a better chance of being found from authentic Italian food in Chula Vista. So it's about the long tail of keywords. If you understand your <laughs> niche better, you'll be able to potentially rank better. In this activity, you'll define your long tail keywords. Now before that, a couple of things that stand out. Uh, I wrote there, potentially rank better. Uh, and then I also have a better chance of being found. And that's the thing about SEO. If you uh, are trying to hire a company to do your SEO and then they tell you yeah you're gonna be number one in a week or number one in a month or number one in three months if they're giving you a hard date that you're gonna be number one I would not hire them that's because SEO the way we're doing it the uh, the organic way is not an overnight thing it takes time and effort and for some people, the time will be shorter and the effort will be less. And for some people, the time will be longer <coughs> and the effort will be longer. So if a company is telling you they're going to be able to do this very, very quickly, probably what they're doing is engaging in tactics that might give you a short-term benefit, but then not a long-term one. So I wouldn't work with a company that is going to be promising great results in a short time. Um, in, in a very specific timetable, actually. So, in general, a three-month window of effort is a good time to then evaluate, how is this working? Are my efforts working? Three months is a good time. In one month, it's way too soon to really get any good data. Two months is better, three months is better. So, what we'll be talking about here in this one-month class might not be giving you the best results in one month, maybe two months, maybe three months. But we're setting a foundation that's going to snowball, if a foundation can snowball. We're going to put a, a seed that will snowball um, in time by setting a foundation. So one of the early things to do then is define our long tail keywords. And I've got two activities here. Again, this is not homework for you to do and to turn in. This is that you work on this for your benefit of your company, or not at all. Maybe you, you want to wait for other parts of the class, but this is something also that we do for real clients. I've got two search activities. We've done kind of part of it already, but then there's an elaboration. On part one, the old way, we've got go to a search engine and plug in a simple keyword from your topic. For the first page of results, write the title and description from each site, and then click on three results. Write notes on what each page features. For example, when was it updated? Does it have a blog? Is the design modern? Is the site mobile friendly? What do you like about it? What don't you like? We're doing here also competitor analysis. Who else is in this space? I thought I was the only you know, vegan fair trade um, non-GMO dog walking company in San Diego. But now I see there's a whole page full of them. So we already did a little bit of the searching in this way. I'm going to go back to the search engine and start with Google. And again, I'm just going to type in very basically web design. For this activity, I've done a simple keyword search. And on this first page of results, 
for as many as you want, of course, but I'm going to make a note of the title and description of the results. And what I mean by that is, let's do this. Let's go to the Start menu and, and open and launch Microsoft Word. Let's open up something to make notes. You can do this on plain old paper. It might be more efficient on Word, so you can just copy and paste some things. But let's uh, go to our Start menu here and type Word so that we can launch Microsoft Word and make some notes. I'm going to launch Word. Blank document is fine. My page of results here, I'm going to make notes on the results. I'm going to focus on the organic results. So I'm going to ignore the ads for the moment. I'm going to focus on the organic results and specific websites. I'm also going to, that means I'm also going to ignore the Yelp results. The TripAdvisor results, the Angie's List results. I'm going to see any results that are actual websites. In my case here, one of my first real results, organic, is Bot Design. So what I'm going to do is just copy that whole little result, the title, the address, and then this description. I'm going to copy it in Word. Here's a trick if you didn't know this. I'm going to right-click and from this little menu select the third option here keep text only if I just do a plain old control V to paste it'll bring it in with all of the formatting with the big font and the color and the underline and all of that stuff that distracts me so if you simply do a regular old paste in Word it's gonna come out like that distracting if you right click and select the third paste option here it only gives you the text that's what I want this is optional this is what is effective for us so I'm going to paste that in. I'm going to start to analyze this. So I see that their title, the first item that appears here is the title. Then we've got the address or the URL, the website name. Uh, and then this description. We'll be able to edit all of this stuff, of course, when we get to that point next time. But on the description, I'm seeing Bop Design is a B2B web design agency and marketing firm in San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles. We do B2B website design, WordPress websites, and so forth. So I'm seeing, also for myself, what are some of these keywords that I need to think about using? Because this number one result has some of these keywords, and we're competing. So it's not just about making a list that's, that, that just says web design. I'm going to make a list that I see also. Marketing is a keyword that I'm seeing up here on more and more results. I'm seeing this keyword B2B. I don't know what B2B is. I've got to look that up. So the point is you're, you're looking at what the competition is doing. Let's see. I've done that. Exactly. You, you competitor analysis in any business is going to work. A dog walking business, realtor, web design, everything. Who else is in this business and what can you do better? So then I'm going to look at uh, this other one here, a real result, Jacob Tyler. I'm going to copy that. Select the paste as text option. So what do we have here? Top web design and San Diego Branding Agency. Notice that these top two ones are not just about web design. One of them mentions marketing, one is B2B marketing, business to business marketing, and one says branding agency. And notice on Jacob Taylor, Jacob Tyler, it doesn't even have the words web design in the address. Again, that's not as relevant as it used to be. In the old days, if you didn't have Jacob Tyler webdesign.com, you wouldn't rank. Nowadays, because that's been abused, it's not as relevant. So you don't have to kill yourself to get your keywords into your web address. Uh, JacobTyler.com is working well for him. Before we all knew what it was, what would you have said Twitter.com is about? Birdwatching, obviously. If you didn't know what Facebook was about before you knew what Facebook is, oh, I don't know, a photography company. So the name of companies don't quite have to be as focused on the keywords like they used to. 
because of many other factors, many other signals that define it, like this um, description and title and the social media and all of that. Here it says San Diego Web Design. I never asked for San Diego, but it knows San Diego because of my location in my computer. Branding agency and marketing firm providing web design, social media, graphic design, print collateral to grow your business. That's very good there. It's also then saying the why. I want to grow my business. I'm not getting any enough customers right now to be sustainable. I need to grow my business. Right there, I've already made a conscious or subconscious connection with them because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to grow my business. Maybe over here, I'm trying to work. I might be a distributor. Uh, that client of the bar that we were talking to yesterday, he was talking about, well, I need to increase my uh, my distributor connections. He needs to get a, a new beer distributor. That's business to business work right there. So BOP Design, they have the word design, but they don't have web design. Uh, BOP Design is uh, specializing in uh, business to business kinds of websites so that my company's website really connects with another business, you know, distributors and, and so forth. On my first page of results, it's I, I you should see that I don't have that many actual websites. I've got blogs, I've got articles, I've got Yelp and all of that, but I found one more here, Ash Web Studio. <coughs> paste that one. San Diego Web Design Company Creating Effective Websites. Okay, sounds a bit generic, but then down here, San Diego Web Design Services Creating Clean, Professional, Goal-Oriented Websites Focused on Building Stronger, More Effective Businesses Online. So, compared to the other two, it's still a little general-ish, but this one they're talking about goal-oriented. Uh, that's good. I don't want to hire someone that is just kind of aimless trying to do a bunch of things. I want a goal to go toward. Part of this activity is making a list of this and you can make as many as you want. I've got three. That's fine for the moment. Part of making this list is then to see what their, their keywords are. So down on my own document somewhere here I can write Uh, generic keywords and then long tail. We haven't done long tail yet, but in the same document I'll write generic keywords. And based on these three that I've looked at so far, I'm gonna start to compile obviously web design. I've seen uh, marketing here and there. I've seen business several times. So if I'm a web designer I want to start to incorporate some of these words if they apply to my company if they apply to what I'm trying to do online. I'm just not just going to take these words because I see that they're hot. I'm going to take them if they apply to my company and what we do. Because the search engines will see through that. If you just take keywords and do keyword stuffing for the sake of taking these keywords, the search engines will see through that and you'll be ranked lower. You're going to take keywords that apply to what your company is about. What we will further do with this activity is, number, uh, number three, click on these results. And now we're going to analyze the website itself. So yeah, you're going to give them uh, a little boost because we clicked them. You are going to click a competitor site and you're going to put your ego aside for a moment. But we're going to click on these competitors. Let's go look at Jacob Tyler's site. Why are they on the first page of, re of organic results? Look at that right away. I see a big, bold graphic in the background. I like this color, uh, these, these um, accents of color. Uh, we exist to generate positive experiences through creative innovation. Check out some stats. So they've done 2,000 successful projects, 991 industry awards. I want to hire them. <laughs> Impressive numbers. We are the number one choice of San Diego web design creative and strategic branding client successes I want to see what, what they've worked with what's new with them download our brochure they're also on Twitter and Facebook now the point of clicking on their link is to as objectively as possible try to dissect reverse engineer analyze 
their site to see what's good, what's bad, what I have a an, an, a subjective uh, opinion of, what are they doing that I'm not doing. They have this website that is a current style, uh, which is uh, you know, a homepage that, that's relatively long. You've got a lot of scrolling here, uh, but big bold graphics. Um, it's all in black and white, so you know that's a that's a trend. It's got these big circles, circular graphics at the moment are a trend. Question. Um, so having a very trendy website like this, where everything's on one page, parallaxed, um, does that increase your SEO? Or your on Google? It's it's not really a big factor um, at the moment, perhaps. But as the search engines see more and more good websites like this, they might make it an, a more important signal. The, again, the thing about it is, what's the content that they're presenting? It is a nice-looking site and navigable pretty well. It happens to be a long, you know, single page kind of website. And as I do more of these, if I as I check more of these websites and I see more and more of them being like that, that gives me an indication for my niche. Maybe my website should also be a long parallax kind of website. Maybe if I'm a bakery and I don't see any of the top results like that, that gives me an indication that that's not a very good trend to follow for that uh, niche. Yes? What about time spent on the website? Do you have an impact on your Yes. Website? Time spent on the website is, is also is, is one of the factors. I can't exactly tell you like what percentage of importance and all of that, but, but it is important how long people stay on your site. But when we get to that next week, we'll talk about, well, what's a good amount of time people spend on your site um, you know, because, because of your niche. So I can't say, make sure your, your people stay three minutes on your site. Three minutes might be too much for a certain site, might be not enough for a certain site. We'll talk about why uh, next time. So the you think the site should be mobile for Google to index you? Yeah, that's one of the signals that recently has been boosted that Google now says if your site is mobile friendly that's gonna be much better than your competitors that are not mobile friendly simply means that if someone visits your site on a mobile device it looks good have you ever been to a website you go to the website you, you, you it loads up and the text is tiny and you have to zoom in to, re to view it that means it's not mobile friendly if it were mobile friendly it would fill the screen nicely the text would be nice and big, readable as soon as you see it. That's mobile friendly. One way to tell if a website is mobile friendly, obviously, is to visit it on your mobile. But another is on the web browser. If you resize your web browser, here it is big and wide, making it smaller. Notice how things are kind of shrinking and rearranging. Notice how the logo got small right there because there's less screen space. I get even smaller, like a mobile device, tall and thin like a mobile device. This is one quick way to check if it's mobile friendly because I have a tall and thin mobile device and that would look better on it. So on first glance, it looks like this website is mobile friendly and Google has made it known that they are going to give press and preference to mobile friendly sites. Not 100% uh, not now, but it'll be one of the things they're going to be more looking at later. So if your website currently is not mobile friendly, that's one of the things you want to start to look at, investing in that. They also have, uh, Google has this, this URL called Mobile Friendly Test. Mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah, that's one of the things we'll be looking at when we create our, our, our accounts. But um, one quick way to test it is just resize the browser. This, is, this seems to be a mobile friendly site. Probably, it, technically, it's known as a responsive website. That's the buzzword also. Easier website responsive which means does your website respond to the different size monitors? If I've got a nice wide laptop monitor, then it responds to that and shows me this much content. If I've got a tablet which is going to be smaller like this, it's going to respond to that size and show it to you optimized. And if you've got a mobile device, it responds to that size 
to fit that better. So what we should be doing here, in addition to what these notes are, write this stuff down. So right now, Jacob Taylor, I'm going to write here, is mobile friendly. <laughs> I'm going to write a single page site in that one, a lot of the content is on one page instead of just having a quick bit of information and then go to about, go to contact and all that. There's a lot of information on a single page. Yeah. Would it make it what? It, it would. Uh, because if all your content needs to be downloaded before you can even view it, yeah, it could slow down your site. So that's another one of the signals that the search engines look at. How fast does your site download? So if you are going to have a website where all your stuff is on one page, you better optimize it so that these graphics load faster. Perhaps that's why the graphics are in black and white. Black and white graphics download faster than color graphics. But this is, seems to be intentional because most of the text they have and like graphics so that it can load up even faster. Monochromatic. Notice that picture right there is red, black, and white. It's monochromatic. Again, that would download faster. And then these graphics right here are flat color graphics. They're not gradients. So that's the thing I'll note right here. Graphics are monochromatic and colors are flat. In WordPress, do they, does it make it so that it is platform or whatever? Or responsive? Is it something we have to do, or is it something that's in there? The good news is that if you're using most modern web design platforms like WordPress or Joomla or Wix, most of the time you're going to automatically get a responsive website, usually. Um, if you're making it in a classic platform like uh, Dreamweaver or front page, most likely it's not responsive. So depending on your platform, you might already have responsive. And the cool thing about WordPress is even if you got a theme that was not responsive, you can activate an option in WordPress that will make it responsive. It will not look amazing, it will not look customized, but it will look responsive. Better, Mobile. Than, better than, not, than not, yes. Uh, so maybe I could write here, site loaded fast. So I'm just making notes. What do I see about the site? What stands out? What's positive? What's negative? Um, so I'm seeing a lot of positive. Even even trivial things, because I would kind of say, I don't quite like, I know that they're using a color palette of red here and there, but I don't like, why are, why are these people in red? That makes me think there's some kind of problem or warning, or the reactor's going to blow up. So <laughs> why did they put those scientist-looking people in, in, in red, in a red box? So even something as simple or that. And this kid doesn't look like he's having a good time, actually, to me. <laughs> so... I'm just going to write odd pictures, odd picture choices. Those are the details. If I notice them, perhaps others will notice them. And if others notice them, that might disincentivize people to really take them seriously or follow through with the conversion. Yeah, it's all this, this um, stuff that you might not have thought of. But um, what else do I see? Get updates. What I would recommend here, and actually this this is a this is a mailing list kind of thing what I would say here's a negative it says get updates but really it's not enough of an incentive to subscribe we probably by now have a lot of trepidation or are wary of giving away our email addresses because we get spam so why would I give away again my email address this is not a good enough call to action Make a note of this term, call to action or CTA, call to action, which is a phrase that entices people to do something. Very vague. So a call to action is going to depend on what you're trying to do on your website. They want me to subscribe. Just by them saying get updates, I'm not convinced. If they said something like, subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive content, that's going to entice me more to subscribe than just subscribe. If I tell people again why 
answer the why, answer what's in it for me, uh, create a call to action answering a why, that'll be more effective than just a generic subscribe or see the portfolio. If you have some sort of call to action that says customer success stories, read customer success stories, learn about our happy customers, some sort of action verbs, <coughs> action terms, a call to action, something to convince people of something. Like this, this is a better one. Ready to share ideas? Let's connect. That's a, that's a bit better. And then that, when you click on that, that takes you over to this page about visit us. <clears throat> or here's our contact information. Send us a message. Notice all the ways to connect. So I would make a note. Uh, very open to connecting or very open to contacting. A negative that I would say, however, is don't put your email out naked like that. I don't know why they have their email like that if they've got a contact form. A contact form is way better than having your email naked like that because there are spam bots that are running 24 hours a day trying to find as many emails as possible every email in the world has a pattern something at something dot something and so if a spam bot finds something with that pattern it will collect it, put it in the database, sell it to spammers, you've got spam so I don't know why they still have their email address like that a contact form like this goes toward preventing spam because here you're gonna fill in this message and a, a spam bot is not gonna be able to figure out this math problem because it's a graphic and it's a little bit of a protection and of course they get smarter and maybe that's not the best one there's some that the numbers spin around and all of that and makes it us for for us to do it also but it makes it harder for the spammers so make a note I do not recommend that you put out your email address naked like that use a contact form do not put your email address naked online use a contact form well, I forgot to say one thing also in this class usually on the last day of class we spend some time if you would like to volunteer to look at your website up on the board here and I'll do a quick audit and we'll op opine on it and all of that so in the nicest meanest way possible I will break down your site if you'd like to show off your site on the on the board on the last day of class and I'll tell you you shouldn't do this you should do this good job on that don't do that <clears throat> yes um, as somebody who would visit that site I would fill out I would email them because I would want to have able to trace that I sent an email and I would want to know who I'm sending it to so if you went what would what would be your process though would you see this email and click on it and then your outlook would launch and then you'd send it on your iPhone okay um, so the, the, that's why I that would be obviously very useful uh, for you uh, but the downside of getting caught up in a spam bot I think outweighs that and I understand that you want that you know paper trail of the outbox that you sent it but really for protection I, I don't recommend to put your address out like that you're gonna get caught by by the spammers and that's gonna be more trouble than that's worth and it does have that convenience and you yourself want to balance convenience and security so um, for yourself that might be the best way and you get a lot of clients out of it and, and hopefully you're, you're not getting spam out of it but a safer way is to have the contact form yes would you put the email as an image would that prevent that from being captured? it could but 
again, these these robots are getting smarter because uh, have you ever uh, worked with OCR, which is that you can take a printout and scan it on your computer and it turns it into a Word document. Well, the spammers can do that with a graphic as well. So if it's a graphic of your email, more sophisticated spam bots could probably figure, could probably convert that via OCR to a real email address. So your contact information, um, you know, I, I, re I do recommend that it be as strong as possible through a contact form that has a CAPTCHA. This thing is called a CAPTCHA when you are preventing spam. Uh, this that it has the naked email I'm not recommending and also notice it's kind of using the old style in that um, it's gonna do a mail to link which means if I click that it's gonna want to open Outlook on this particular computer Outlook is not set up on this computer I'm not even gonna be able to send the email that's sort of a waste also maybe on your home computer you have Outlook set up or you know Apple mail and, and it works but not everyone does and when they click on it nothing will happen and therefore they'll never contact you so really it, it's up in in short it's up to what you want to do online but that's my recommendation my company and professional recommendation use a contact form I'm seeing here that they're on Facebook Twitter and LinkedIn so I'll make a note of that using Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. <clears throat> that seems to work for them. They're on page one. I might want to do that. But maybe LinkedIn doesn't really work for my particular business. Maybe Instagram works. I also noticed they had Instagram. Not in the same spot. They made it up at the very top over here. What's this little thing hiding over here? That's their Instagram and Pinterest. That's not consistent there. They've got these social networks on top here, but they don't have it down there. And where's that and where's that pin where's that Instagram link anyway? Okay, I see the Instagram icon, but I don't see where's their Instagram. And these are not clickable. So I'm gonna write uh, in, that's LinkedIn. That's their LinkedIn. <clears throat> so I'm going to write using Facebook to LinkedIn, but social buttons are not consistent. So this is what we can do for your website on the last day of class. We can break it down and I'll give you recommendations and such, but uh, your task is to look at your competitor this way. You're doing a competitor analysis, the good, the bad. You might not have the vocabulary and the experience to kind of explain some of this stuff, but that's fine. You're still just checking what the competition is doing. Um, <clears throat> the, the second part of, uh, of this is the long tail. I would do another search, but this time the long tail. And notice I say in a clean search engine. Note down here. The note of what does clean search engine mean is a clean, clean search engine is one where you have reset your web browser. I recommend cleaning out all the cookies and browsing history before using the search engine. This will give you more accurate results. I recommend using a web browser just for these types of searches. If your main browser is Chrome, for example, use Firefox when conducting the, the searches. Each browser is different. You'll have to find out how to reset yours. This is important to get results like how your potential visitors or customers would. So have you, well, let me say it this way. People come to these classes and tell me, when I search, you know, my long tail keywords, I come up number one. But then when I go to my friend's house, I'm on page 99. What's going on? Well, that person is getting on number one not because they're being tricked, but these web browsers are a tool to visit websites. And these web browsers are software that evolves and gets better, in theory. And the web browser remembers your search history. It remembers your search terms. It remembers the pages you visited most. And so Google also remembers that. They set a cookie on your web browser that you search for a certain thing often. 
So if you search for the same thing or a similar thing next time, you will get results tailored to you. It's not trying to trick you, it's trying to help you in that it shows you these results that it thinks you want to, to find. That's going to hurt you when you're trying to search like your potential clients which have never heard of you and never searched for you. So I'm saying here, if you clean out your cookies, if you reset the history, if you go in, and I forgot to write it here, if you go into private mode or incognito mode or whatever your web browser calls it, here in Chrome it's called incognito mode, Firefox it's called private window, those are supposed to also not save your, your search history. So for me to be the most effective and paranoid, I reset, I clean out all the cookies, I reset the history to empty, and then I turn on private mode and then do the searches. Because then that's more of a that's more of the way that a potential client would be searching for you. They don't know anything about you, but they're searching these keywords. And so I'm saying for the second activity here, you're gonna clean out a do a, a use a clean web browser. Or if all day long you use Chrome, switch over to Safari. All the web browsers are a free download. Switch to the other web browser and use that web browser to do your search. But remember to clean it out, to use private mode, incognito mode, whatever, to do these searches that will be more realistic. You're going to search the long tail. Authentic Italian food in San Diego. Or highly ranked Mexican food places near me. You know, uh, the long tail, the natural, the natural word, keyword search, in a clean search engine. And again, you're going to make a note of the top results. And again, you're going to click on those and, and dissect their site in positive and negative ways, in objective as possible, and also subjective analysis, competitor analysis, but with the long tail in a clean search engine. You should be then compiling a list of 10 simple keywords and then a list of five complete phrases. That's your long tail. By researching your competition, you are seeing what has worked for them. You are defining what sets you apart and what you have to offer in contrast to your competition. You will use your long tail keywords throughout your site, in post pages, for example, post 10 pages. But you will also create content that fits the overall theme of your site. You will become an authority in the field you've targeted. You will, create a, you will create content on a regular basis and you will spread this content throughout in the internet. We will do these things. I'm just showing you in the general concept. And if you get the book, if you look in chapter one, that's a good read there talking about quality content. So we'll talk about creating content on a regular basis. That's blogging, in short. Spreading it throughout the internet, that's social media in short. Adding your keywords and, and such, that's adding it to your meta tags and your meta description and all of that. We'll be doing that. Um, we'll be then walking the fine line that we're not doing keyword stuffing because that's not going to help us. Just because we've compiled 15 phrases and such, that does not mean I'm going to put all 15 on every single page of my website. Judiciously, and we'll do this together, talk about which one keyword really applies for this one page what one long tail keyword applies to these two pages, what keyword I might want to use on today's tweet, and so forth. Once we know what our competition is like and compile this list and such, we will apply it next week. That's why I said bring your password. If you've got a website, we can start to talk about applying this to your website. If you don't have a website, that's fine. You can still uh, follow along, take good notes. Uh, if you'd like to kind of experiment a little bit with a website, you can go over to wordpress.com and create a free website right now, pretty fully functional. The catch is that your website will be something like victorsbakery.wordpress.com, not victorsbakery.com. If you create a free WordPress site here, it'll have the wordpress.com. They'll try to sell you the version that is Victor's work, victorsbakery.com, you don't have to buy it. Um, don't buy anything yet. But if you want to create a free website to start applying this stuff, you can get it at wordpress.com. 
And so once you've done this analysis of your competitors, compiled your list, and start adding it to your site and such, you want to track, is it working? Is the time that I spent giving me a good ROI, return on investment? We'll be able to tell that once we set up Google Analytics, Bing <coughs> Analytics, all of that stuff that tells us how many visitors did I get? What pages did they visit? How long did they spend on my site? We'll be able to get so much data you won't believe. We'll be able to tell what web browser they used and what city they came from, what language is on their computer, what was the size of their mobile device, track all that data. And so that's why you want to bring your password next time. Um, so we'll be able to track any of our changes, or any of our effort, that is, if we have, do we have changes, positive or negative? Um, so, we're going to end the main lecture in just a moment. We'll have a little lab time until 9.30, and then, um, and then we'll end the day, and we'll come back next week, and we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, look at the calendar to see what's in store, and, and, and so forth. But any general questions about anything we've talked about today? Yes? I'm going to go over software like OneSell Pro, stuff like help you figure out. I'll touch on things here and there, but uh, the exercise I think might be more effective the hard way in the beginning to, to do this kind of analysis in the beginning. And then there are tools that will help us along that way. But then we also have to sort of, you know, vet those tools. How effective are they? What's their agenda? Where are they pulling their information from? Do I have to pay for it? And sometimes if we're on a budget, you know, spending a hundred dollars or something on software, is, is not a top priority. And yeah, there's plenty of tools that will help us with this, but we're going to do it the hard way the first time, uh, which is compile our keywords and such on our own. So we'll, we'll end the lecture at this point and have a little lab time.